Hello guys, thank you so much for joining me for this Running For Real chat. I have my dear friend with me, Sarah Crouch. Um, for anyone watching on replay, um, you can still type your uh, questions to her in the comments and she is happy to answer them. So even if you're coming here later on, you don't have to feel like you can't be involved in this, you're still welcome to join. And Sarah is very good at responding to people. So if you type a question, um, she will answer there. So um, for, it's going to take a few minutes to get people involved in this conversation or to join in. Um, so I'm just going to give it a few minutes just uh, to let people come in and maybe you and I, Sarah, could talk about um, the Boston Marathon this morning for a minute while we kind of give people a second to get in. So what were your thoughts on that? Well, actually, Boston? I was about to ask you the same thing just because this is the first time you've watched uh, a major race like not having... Mm. that professional running like position like how did that did that was that weird for you at all or um it's weird actually I was I, Sarah and I were talking about this a little bit but actually um it was strange when we were watching oh we got 12 people in here hello Eddie hi <laughs> say hi if you're coming in now um it was weird because I actually didn't really miss it that much mm -hmm. um and I kind of I felt like a respect for people but I wasn't like oh I want to do that which is every single marathon I've ever watched I well, not ever. In the last, like, three or four years. Mm -hmm. I've watched, I've been like, oh, I kind of wish I was doing it. But this time it was different. So I guess that means I've made the right choice, right? I think so, yeah. I mean, I definitely felt the opposite watching it. Um, watching Boston this year and having run it last year, I was watching it and it feels like it's been a decade since I mm. ran it last year. Um, I was definitely envious of, of those who had good races and everything. But for those of you, if you, for some reason, if you have run it, um, or if you ran it today and you're back in your hotel room and you're depressed, guys, it was about 71 at the start is what I'm hearing. So it was definitely not a slow year despite the tailwind. So I um, just want to encourage everyone who did do it, you know, that you, I'm sure you gave your best and, and mm -hmm. pushed hard up and over um, the hills. But it's it's a tough course. It's a really tough race. But I definitely think I'll be back and I hope someday that you will do Boston. That's, I think I will. that's my dream. So maybe we'll do it together, right? Yeah, that would be <laughs> so much fun. Although if it's my first one back, I might be running like an hour slower than you and I'll be like, Hey, <laughs> coming towards the finish, and you'll look that like just means you get to enjoy it longer. Just yeah, do it yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah, no, I definitely want to do Boston at some point. So um, hopefully that will be. I was saying, Sarah, because we were watching it this morning. I said maybe that will be the comeback marathon. Maybe mm -hmm. like in a few years that will be the one that like when I decide I do want to run again, I can be like, you know what, I want to just enjoy the experience of Boston, um, and you know, just be happy that I. I did it, I guess. So of we course. have, yeah, 19 people in here right now and how many watching afterwards. Um, hello to Sasha, Peg, Linda, Jill, Mary, Ian, Eddie. You guys have all said hello. If you are joining, you can still say hi. We're not scary. We <laughs> are very real people. I can We're a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually nearly, um, a, a few minutes ago before we actually came on the chat, she said something about... Um, what was it you said about being a 2.30? Oh, that we define ourselves by our PRs. Have you ever right. done that, guys? Have you ever like introduced yourself and kind of said what you run? So I, as on this thing you saw, I put Sarah, 2.32 marathoner, and Sarah said it's kind of sad. And I like about like burning. <laughs> she almost smacked me. Yeah, yeah because she, cause I was like, are you saying 2.32 is slow? <laughs> but no, <laughs> what, I, what I meant was just saying how it's like that's how... Um, I feel like I, I would, in a way, market myself or to say, hey, I've, I've run this and, and how we, a lot of times we attach our identity to our times and how mm -hmm. that's not necessarily a good thing because um, when, when a period of time goes by where you don't run your best or you don't set a PR, you can't let that damage your self-worth. And we've mm -hmm. talked about that quite a bit. Yeah, we can talk about that now, I guess. So maybe like kind of tell us a bit about um, what you're up to and, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is training. running for real, so let's be real. I haven't set a PR in about two and a half years. Um, it's been two and a half years since I was able to say this is the fastest I've ever been. And that's really, really hard. And for those of you who are going through the same thing, I definitely feel for you. And it's hard not to feel washed up, to feel like, oh my gosh, are my best years behind me? Um, but at the same time, if what it comes down to is if you still love running, if running still brings you joy as opposed to happiness, mm -hmm. true joy, um, at which for me, it's like there's no greater pleasure than just being outside and feeling the world move beneath my feet. I still love it so much that even if I spent the next 10 years of my career without setting another PR, um, I would still want to do it. I would still want to run. So there are more reasons to run um, than to set a PR. And that goes doubly for those of you who are maybe 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old. You're starting to um, to age a little bit. And maybe it's, it's possible to look back and say, okay, well, my best years are definitely behind me. Um, there are still dreams to chase. There are still new things to do, new races to try, new experiences. And I do look forward to that part of running actually quite a bit. I think mm -hmm. about that a lot. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've done really good with that, like reminding me of that over the years as well, because you're very like, 
uh, well, I guess we can kind of say when I did decide to stop running, I mean, you wrote about it on your blog post, which we're going to talk about Sarah's blog post mm-hmm. in a minute that you guys might be interested in. Um, I kind of said, to, or Sarah wrote about it, and I did, at the time, I was kind of scared to tell Sarah that I wanted to stop running because I thought she would kind of be a bit mad at me, a bit upset, because Sarah loves running more than anyone I know. <laughs> and, like, just this, the sheer, like, like you said, the joy of it, like, during the moment. And so I was, like, scared because I was like, gosh, she's not going to understand. But actually she did, and mm-hmm. she was, like, really happy for me. But, like, you've, over the years, been really good at, like, reminding me of that, like the actual joy you get in the moment of being in there. And I think too often we get kind of guilty of like, like I, I, we were talking about this on the drive back from um, lunch that um, I was kind of getting to the point with running where I was chasing happiness. I wanted the happiness at the finish line. And, but there's a difference between happiness and then joy, the joy, you want to chase the joy, which is in the moment when you're running. It's in the process of training mm -hmm. rather than, than the, the outcome of racing. It's in the, it's in the journey, not the destination as a much of a cliche as that Mm -hmm. is. I hate to say it, but we were also discussing how, um, you know, and, and for you guys, like, I know this is difficult to do, but really think back for a second on your first race. And I don't mean like your first organized 5k or like organized marathon. For me, when I was six years old, there was this boy I went to church with and he had the same last name as me. And we got in a little fight as you do when you're six years old about (laughs) who should really deserve that last name of Porter. And I remember challenging him. I was like, Brian, we are going to race to that far fence and back, you know, and it was, it's this thing where when you're a child and if you go to a playground and you watch kids run around, there is an animal inside of you. There is a basic human instinctual animal who wants to beat the other animals around you to the finish line. And I think that it's really important to, as an adult runner, to get back in touch with that animal. And it's not very easy to do Mm. um, because a lot of the time, especially for a lot of the athletes that I coach, you know, I'll get comments like, oh, I was in the last mile of that race, but I looked at my GPS and I noticed that my heart rate was a bit high. I'm like, you know what? When you're in the last mile of a race, you need to be a competitor racing the people around you all out it doesn't matter what any number on your wrist says like be a competitor be a human being be that animal and find mm-hmm. that that drive with you because i promise that it's in there i do yep see isn't she so wise and <laughs> can i just say i did not feel her head anything to do with the running by feel the trust in your body the mm-hmm. just running to race rather than looking at these damn watches she literally came up with that just thinking about it herself it's like sasha has a good yep. question um okay sasha are there any races you would like to be doing just for fun, not necessarily as an elite, but just for the joy and the experience? Uh, Western State 100 miler. Wow, you didn't even have to think about that. No, and also (laughs) Badwater. I know we've discussed this before, but the Badwater, I I have I have wanted to do that. Well, when I was in college, even when I was running 5Ks and 10Ks by myself, I would not train anyone to do this, um, but I was running really, really, really long, long runs. I built up to, even as a freshman, about 28 mile long runs because I so badly want to find that's the limit I care about more than any other limit is like Mm. I want to know how far I can run until I drop physically or mentally until I crack and to be perfectly honest I haven't found it yet and I think it will take me doing a hundred mile ultra you know or something like that to really find that limit and I am fascinated by that and I do feel like at some point probably around my mid-30s I'll make the transition to ultra running full-time because and more than anything else and I know some people are city runners and they love being, you know, around other people in houses, I, I need to be out in the woods. Mm-hmm. I need to, oh, yeah, to be do, out in the definitely. woods. That's really important to me. So at some point, I'll, I'll definitely do that. That's a great question, Sasha. Thank you. Yeah, we uh, and Reist is saying, yes, Ultra. He ran his first 50 miler just a few weeks ago. So he's still um, coming, uh, you know, going through the experiences of coming through and what he did with that. So that's good for him. Um, Mard, uh, I saw your nice comment. He said, wow, two of the best coaches in the World Wide Web are online. Yes, we are. <laughs> We are right here. We are flattered. Thank so, you. Let me hit your head. <laughs> um, and uh, sorry if you can't hear. Everyone else, I'm assuming, can hear, right? Because you are responding. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, what other questions do you guys have for Sarah? Anything you would like to know? We have a speedy, speedy girl here. And, you know, she's a wonderful human yeah. being. So If not, we can also chat about the, the blog and all that. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, in the meantime, while you're thinking of your questions, why don't you talk about what happened with you lately, if people do not know? Right. Um, so it's just funny because every time we hit a new year, like 2016 to 2017, <laughs> I always am like, this is my year. 2017 is going to be amazing. I'm going to PR in everything and everything's just going to be smooth sailing. And that's never the way it is. But this year has been especially rough. Um, March 14th, we got a phone call. We were uh, Michael and I were laying in bed. My husband, well, hopefully my husband, if I was laying in bed with him, um, <laughs> and he got a phone call from his sister and, and, uh, uh, completely unexpectedly, his father passed away. So that night we were up all night, um, packed our clothes, flew 
across the country to California. I didn't sleep for about 42 hours in a row. Um, and so we were dealing with a lot of family stuff um, for a couple weeks there. And I did attempt to race once at that point, but um, I actually came home from California. The race. Can went... I pause you that? So that that race. Tell them about that race and like how much you realize the emotional side of things kind of affect yeah, you. Yeah, because people do have stuff like this happen quite often. Right. And if you're watching this, like, and you can, I'm sure you can tell better than anyone else if you are left left brain to right brain. But for me personally, I think I just have two right brains. I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure I don't have a left brain. I'm extremely emotionally driven, but it's, it's kind of hit me lately. And one of my athletes actually, and I discussed this a while back, but how I don't race well when I'm under the influence of emotion. I don't, um, if I pour my heart into something too much, I, there are times and places in running for emotion when I'm out on that, sure, that 20 miler in the woods and I'm just free and wild and I listen to music and I just am, um, that's a very emotional time for me. But with racing, it, it can sometimes help to go out there and be like, you know what? No emotion, just execution. This is a job. I'm a slave to my splits and I just need to get the job done because um, when I rely too heavily on emotion, I tend to feel very defeated. I let the negative thoughts in as well as the positive. It's hard for me to close that floodgate. Yep. Um, so that's one thing that was really, really tough on me was was running after having to deal with you know a grieving husband and his family and and uh, my own grief as well. But um, what would you I, suggest for someone then if they were if they were if going you, through a lot of like emotional stuff? Would you say to race or would you say to kind of put it off until? That's a great question. Again, I think it depends on the person. And I think for people who are extremely left brain and I view their minds more as like an ego waffle where you have all these <laughs> compartments and they put running is here and family is mm. here and my love life is here. All these little compartments where my brain is spaghetti. Everything is connected. All these noodles oh, run too, into yeah. each other. We're spaghetti brains. <laughs> and so for me, it's like if I'm attempting to race during a time like that, it's very, very difficult to try and disconnect the pile of spaghetti and find the string that's just racing. Mm. But if you are a very left brain person, you say, you know what? Running is my therapy. It's my time where I can just tune out and and feel nothing but running. Go ahead and do that. That's fine. Um, but for me, what I had to do, and I ended up, I actually just raced again, um, and it went. I ran about. It was a five k, about forty one seconds faster than I did the previous time. It's because I shut. I was able to shut that off somehow. And my mantra was just. It was simply no emotion, just execution. That's all it was. Trusting that animal mm -hmm. instinct of saying, I'm going to race the people around me, and mm -hmm. I'm not going to let that right brain um, take over. But anyway, so we got back from California and... Can I ask you one more question before you got back yes. from California? Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just as I'm sure... People, so when you were in that race, you said you ran 40 seconds faster than you did the last one, mm -hmm. but you were still, like you said, you haven't PR'd. So how did you stop when you were in that moment and you knew you weren't going to run a PR, you knew you were off, how did you stop it from spiraling like out of control, even though you said, I want to do this task, or you, know, you looked at it very like logistically but you kind of still knew that you weren't going to hit that time. Like, how did you stay positive or how did you keep like, yeah. fighting? Um, I, I think it helps. One thing that I was discussing with my sister, actually, she was out there and she raced as well, is that those emotions, even during a race, they come and go like a tide. So it's like a tide, it's like the doubt, it'll it'll fill up, it'll be high tide, and you're like drowning in it during a race, and, and then it'll end back down, you're like, I'm okay, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, during that race, mentally, I left the ocean, crawled up on the beach, sat there, and let the tide come and go, and I was like, no matter mm -hmm. what I'm feeling, physically, this is my, my position, my job to do. And I, I remember, this is so, it's running for real. <laughs> there was a girl in front of me who on the bottom of her shorts we wear when we run basically a bikini bottom is what most of the uniforms are and she ran for big bear college or something so i remember staring at the letters like on her butt <laughs> and i'm like i'm not gonna let those letters get more than a few feet in front of me like that's and it was simply is something like it's it, that's the same concept of, of staying on a treadmill and not letting it not letting yourself fall off that's what it was in that moment as she mm. became my treadmill and i was like that is going to prevent me from thinking too hard and most of the the really good races i've run have been where i simply attached a rope, a mental rope to someone else. And I let them do the thinking, let them do the work, let them pull me along, despite the fact that I was in a lot of physical pain myself. Mm -hmm. Which I think is, is a good point because again, it's that like, you're not looking at a split to tell you what pace to run. You're running oh, it by feel. I got to answer this question. Ian says, what's the best advice someone gave you about training and or racing? You guys are going to love this. When I was in college, I had a roommate who was not a runner. Um, and she was a very blunt girl, but she was amazing. We really got along well, but she, I'm sure I've told you this before, but, mm -hmm. um, I came back from a race and it hadn't gone well and I was moping. I was miserable and I was like, I just, I can't believe this. I was, I was four seconds off when I got here and I just, I blew up at the end and she finally, she sat there patiently. And then when I stopped talking, she was like, you know what, Sarah, don't flatter yourself. Nobody cares. <laughs> And in that moment, it freed me. I was so liberated because I was like, oh, people are disappointed. People are mad at me. No, at the end of the day, 
when you don't run well, sure, the people who love you, your family, your coaches, they're going to be disappointed for you. Nobody's mad. No one's upset at you. You're the you're your own worst critic. And that to me was the most liberating advice. It's like, yeah, when you have a bad one, it sucks. And and sometimes, especially if it's a goal marathon, it sucks for a really long time. Um, but at the same time, you are the only one who's mm-hmm. going to be completely devastated about that. And that that is uh, really freeing in a way. So I want to pause for that. We're going to finish your story before we get to any more questions there. But um so for anyone, if you're watching this later and you ran Boston today or you ran a race this weekend, listen to what Sarah just said right there. <laughs> like your family and friends love you no matter what. I'm always harping on about this. Um, they care about you and everyone else, it, not, you know, that you think they're disappointed in you, but like Sarah says, they probably don't care. So keep that in mind. If you have had a bad race this weekend or today, mm-hmm. that it doesn't matter and you're going to be fine. You're going to move on. So, okay. You got back from California. Let's go back there. Right. So, but right before I left for California, um, I had noticed in the past couple of months, um, I was starting to be able to feel this kind of hard lump, um, on my lower back and it was, it's not like visible to the skin, but if I like bend over, I can like, I can feel it like through my skin and it's, it's, uh, it's deeper in there. But, um, I had gone to the doctor about it and he had told me, um, he's like, Oh, it's, I'm sure it's just a cyst. It's probably no big deal. Um, but he, he wanted to get an ultrasound done on it anyways, just to rule out anything serious, like, uh, like it being a tumor or something like that. So, um, so I got back from California and two days later I went into the hospital, did an ultrasound. And I remember, I think, I don't think I'll honestly ever forget, but I remember the phone call and I just heard it in the woman's voice and she's like, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but it turns out that you have a tumor, um, growing just above your kidney. And, uh, at this point it's funny because I'm in a very much a limbo period where I don't know if it's cancerous or not. Um, I will, I have a consultation with the surgeon on the 25th, but that was just another thing added to my plate racing while knowing, oh my gosh, like there's a tumor that's Mm -hmm. literally growing inside my body right now. And it is, it's scary. And in a way, uh, if I can just pin it down to one emotion, I was extremely angry. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very mad at my own body. I felt betrayed by a body that I treat really well and that I, um, that I thought I knew. Um, and it's just one of those things that we discussed where I wasn't sure I wanted to write about it or post about it because it's, it's a very, it's an extremely personal thing. And especially if it does end up being cancerous, um, to now open myself up to tell people, Hey, I'm going through a journey that is really, really rough. Um, but at the same time, you had a really great point where you said, look, you're 27 years old. You're an elite athlete. How many people think they're healthy? You think they don't need to worry if they, if they find something or feel Mm -hmm. something. So um, and I, I have gotten some responses where people are like, look, I went into the doctor and I got checked out. Thank you for pushing me to do that. So that, that to me, if even that, even just one person went in and found something, um, that was, that was definitely worth it. Yeah. So Sarah, you know, she, she called me, um, well, after she got the phone call as well, but when she, she called me, um, I think it was the day, the day after, or maybe that day later on, we, we talked about whether she should say something and she was like, oh, I don't know. And like, she just said, she did share it. And you know, I hope you guys will kind of take this. I will put a link in the comments to the blog post that we're talking about here. So you can read the full thing, but to just as a reminder, I wanted, you know, her to talk about this because we all think we're invincible. We think we run, we eat well, we look after ourselves, we get good sleep. We, you know, we, we might eat organic, we might do all these things. And then you think you're kind of, you kind of feel like, oh, that doesn't happen to me, but it does. And like, you know, Sarah is literally the pinnacle of health. Like if you look at a person, but yet she had something like this happen. So take it as a mm. reminder to, you know, if you, if something doesn't feel right in your body, get it checked. Just in case. And mm-hmm. yeah, most of the time it's nothing, but, but just in case. And it's true that as runners, I think that we tend to go through a lot of worst case scenarios. Like when you're the night before a marathon, you try and tell me that you've never had a nightmare about running the night before a marathon, because <laughs> come on, like we all have those dreams where like we get beat, you know, by a lot or we end up finishing dead last or we, we are running in sand, you know, it's like, and so it's been the kind of the same thing with this, where it's like, my mind has gone through a lot of worst case scenarios about, okay. Um, you know, what if it is cancer? And then you come to the next split, which is okay. Is it treatable or not? And then, Mm -hmm. you know, the next split after that. And, and, um, I've definitely gone down the worst case scenario, but at this, at this point in time, you know, I thought even if, even if just hypothetically, like, you know, a doctor was like, Hey, you've got a year to live. I thought the biggest question was what would I do like with my time? And and the truth is I would run every single day because I just love it so much. And that's how I want to invest my time and spend my time. Mm -hmm. I don't know necessarily if I, what would you do if you had a year to live? Like, what would you, have you thought about that? I don't know. I think I'd go traveling. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd just try and go. I would definitely do that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And just see, see everything. But it's like, you know, and, 
And again, that's also how I know that it's like this is still, even on the days that really suck and the races that don't go well, how I know I still want to be doing this is because that's my natural instinct is to say I would I would want to run for as long as I could. Um, yeah, so we can, I guess we can get to a couple yeah. of questions. Okay, but... so David said, um, what are some of the biggest training mistakes you've made so we can avoid them? <laughs> oh my gosh, there's so many I can't even like pen it down. Um, uh, I think that when I look back to my last, I've been running professionally for, this is my sixth year of running professionally. And even as a professional runner, I've made several mistakes, but um, I've had two coaches as a professional runner. The first one I had for about five years and the second one I've been working with for almost a year. And I, I think that there's definitely been times where I refuse to acknowledge my own blind spots. And as runners, you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've run, I promise it will serve you well to have a coach, to have a training program because we all um, think we know ourselves better than anyone else. And in ways we do, but I, I, I tend to think I have eyes on my training that no one else has. But the truth mm. is it, it really serves you better to have someone else dictate. And especially because I think runners fall into one of two categories. They're either, they need to be pushed by a coach and to be told what to do because they don't have the internal motiv motivation. Or in our case, mm. we need a coach to rein us back. And so I've had... <laughs> I've definitely butt heads with a few coaches, but um, I, I definitely think that I, I'm the kind of athlete who needs to be told when to stop. And uh, I've definitely hit races overtrained because I wanted to do more than the coach said. And, and that's probably my biggest mistake. Let's talk about that for a minute. Because when you have gone into the last two marathons, I think mm -hmm. you have said to me like a week before, two weeks before, you're like, I, I don't feel ready. I, I can't be ready. But we kind of talked about how in previous ones you'd gone into it overtrained. Mm -hmm. So would you like to give any perspective now that you have done that? Like for anyone who has a marathon coming up or a race coming up and they feel, how can I possibly be ready? Kind of in that stage that you yeah. have, what would you like to say? My answer is that you will never, ever feel ready. Nope. No matter how much you do, you run 200 miles a week. You're not going to feel ready. When you hit the week of the marathon, you're going to think I should have done something differently. I should have done something more. Um, and I think that that's also a big tendency of people is to force things to happen during the taper because they want to get in every little bit of extra work. When mm -hmm. the truth is your body is just at two weeks before the marathon. That's when you need to start feeling like I need to feel well rested. I need to feel antsy. I need to feel like a horse chomping at the bit rather than exhausted all the way through. Um, so that's definitely something that I've had to learn is that, um, more training does not always mean better training. Sometimes smarter means less. And it's, mm -hmm. it's tough cause that goes against my nature of wanting to stand on the starting line and look around and be like, I have outworked every single person on the starting line. That's my instinct. But so related to that, um, something that I just thought of while you were talking. So quite often I'll have people email me and you probably have the same thing, or maybe you guys have people that speak to you and they say, you know, I want this so bad. I want to run well so bad. I try so hard. I push myself so hard and I do everything I can. And I often say to them, chill out. Like you, if you, you're coming to me, I know you're trying to prove that you're committed, but you're actually, I can already tell that when these people email me that they're like kind of. It, they've taken it too far and they're putting too much stress on it and too much pressure and stuff. So what would you say to people who are kind of in that thing of like, yeah, but I'm outworking, like you, you said, I'm outworking everyone. Right. So that's the thing is that most people outwork in the wrong ways. And I'll say what I mean by that is, um, and I've coached at this point, probably over 150 people, the number one mistake. And I'll say, I don't think I've had more than 5% of athletes come to me without having made this mistake. The number one mistake that I see most runners make who I coach, 95% is they're running too hard on their easy days. They're not willing um, to accept the fact that training is like, it's not this 45 degree angle, it's a, it's a stair step. Your hard days are gonna break you down, they're hard, they're vertical, but those easy days have to be a plateau. Mm. They're there to recover you. They are there to make it easier to climb that staircase where most people look at it as saying, okay, if I'm not running hard, I'm not getting better, when the opposite is true. You run hard every single day, especially on your easy days, you're going to go right down the other side of that hill because your body's going to break down. It has to have this um, reoccurring pattern of breaking down on the hard days, building back up on the easy days. And so when you negate that by running too hard on your easy days, um, you're not going to reap the benefits. And beyond that, you're going to reach those hard days and you're not going to be able to truly rip it um, like you would be if you were rested. So a lot of people talk to me and, and about paces and, and this and that. And the truth is between my marathon pace and my easy days, there's about three minutes 
per mile worth of difference. I run in, my marathon pace is 549 per mile. There are easy days that I'm not breaking nine minutes if I'm tired, if I'm exhausted. Are you listening to that right now? I mean it. Talking. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe if I say it in a British accent, they'll listen. No, <laughs> no, they don't listen. To don't it. run so hard. No, but <laughs> seriously, seriously, start taking your easy days easy. And and at first, people feel guilty. They they come home and they're like, "Gosh, well, I feel like I didn't get anything done." Yeah, you did. You got recovery done on yes. that day, and that's that's what you need to do. So then, what about if someone is saying, "Okay, how do I know if I'm running easy enough?" Like. Because I, I see it a lot with, let's say, around three, three, about 3.30 marathoners that will say, you know, their pace is, what is 3.30 marathon, like 7.15? 7 7 That's something? closer to 8, I think. Okay. Yeah. But then they'll say, well, you know, let's say my race pace is 7.30 per, per mile. I'm going to, if I run 8.10, 8.15, that's mm-hmm. slow enough. How do people know if they're running slow enough? Or like, let's say they run... 10 minute miles for a marathon how so do they know if it's, it's definitely objective or i'm sorry it's subjective because your easy pace will vary day to day if you truly listen to your body the same pace for me that feels like the 7 30 pace on one day might equal 10 minute pace the next day but it's because my body is really tired the day that i was running 10 minute pace so that's the problem too and i harp on this all the time but like people who are absolutely 100 percent connected to their gps watches They think, okay, well, my pace range has to be 8.30 pace every single day. No, it doesn't. Your body doesn't know pace. Your body knows effort. And when you're exhausted because you had a hard speed workout the day before, that easy pace is going to be a lot slower, at least it should be, um, than it should on a day where you've had a few easy days in a row. You've got that pep in your step and and you're running a couple minutes a mile faster. So for me, it's honestly like legitimately listening to your body and how you know that you're doing that is I have a little rule of thumb is if you can say the Pledge of Allegiance, this is only for Americans, no, um, whatever, if you can say go through the alphabet without feeling short of breath, like you're able to have a good conversational, light, easy pace and you can be honest with yourself and say, I'm not pushing at all, then you're running easy enough. Yes, good. I'm so glad you mentioned that as well because whenever I say it, I have had, say have a conversation with a friend but that doesn't really help if you haven't got anyone to talk to. And probably don't want to sound like a crazy person. Like, if you're like, how are you? I'm great. <laughs> um, but see, do you see that she's literally saying the exact same thing that I'm always telling you with run easy. Because it works. Yeah, yeah, because it works. And you'll hear it over and but over it and takes, over But it takes for people who come to running, running their easy days too hard, which is most of you, I promise. It takes a leap of faith. To say, okay, I'm going to back off on my easy days and I hope that by running slower, I'm going to get faster. You have to trust and you have to take that step off the cliff and hope that those PRs are going to be there to catch you. We'll be there as well. <laughs> yeah, we're already down in the canyon. <laughs> we jumped off the cliff and it's great down here. The water's <laughs> fine. Come on in. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm lying on the beach right now. <laughs> but okay. All right. Let's get back to our questions here. So Sasha said, watching Boston, it struck me how many people yell when they see the top runners. Does this help you or irritate you as you're getting tired? Oh man. And That's I've got a great question perspective on that because last year I don't know how many of you watched Boston last year but I led uh, myself and another American Neely Spence we led for a couple miles of the race at around mile six to mile eight we were in the front so and we the women start a half hour before the men the elite women so we were literally the first human beings that the crowd had seen so they were going absolutely nuts and for me it definitely helps and you have, you can speak to this as well what doesn't help is when people offer unsolicited advice like run faster go okay i'm doing the best i can like you know it does it definitely does help like some people offer helpful advice especially if you're running a very tactical race and it helps when someone yells hey there's someone 50 meters back and they're closing like that'll help because you need you need that information to kind of gauge if you're in it for place um and if your position really matters but um the actual screaming itself the cheering i love it Mm -hmm. i thrive off that some people and i've spoken to elite runners before who are like dude i don't hear anything Mm. i'm just tunnel vision i can't hear a thing i hear everything i hear every single word that's being spoken to me i'm very even like let's say mile 25 because I feel like I feel like the last three miles I'm it, I'm on tunnel vision. I think I would hear it in that moment, but I probably wouldn't remember it by the time I, it would it would be in and out um, mm-hmm. by the time I got to the finish. But for you, what do you like those cheers? Like I do like it, but I again it's the same kind of thing as what she said. Like um, if if people are yelling like sprint or like hmm. yeah like run faster or like um, you know push harder, and I'm I'm like it kind of almost becomes like a like. Don't tell me I'm not pushing hard enough. <laughs> like, like, you get out here and do yeah, it, buddy. So I'd say if, if you do see someone coming past and you do kind of want to yell, then maybe yell something like, you're doing great. You, you're you almost... No, not you're almost there. You're That's the worst. Okay. Don't say you're almost there. If you're in mile one of a marathon and you're saying you're almost there, you're a jerk. Or even at like mile <laughs> 20, because you're like, I've got six <laughs> exactly. miles. But like, just say something that is like going to build them up. 
like you look strong like you've yes, got this like helps, confidence yeah. like be kind to yourself words one like, thing i am a fan of though is the ironic signs that mm. are there for a laugh because i do enjoy that i will never forget my my debut well my professional debut in the marathon was new york city marathon it was not going well but one thing that literally made me laugh out loud at about mile 15 there was this little girl holding a sign on the sidewalk and it said this is the worst parade i've ever seen <laughs> and i laughed because it was just so funny um so i do enjoy things like that because at the end of the day it's it's a sport meaning it's a game like we're out there for enjoyment for like you know recreation and pleasure and and it sometimes helps to remember okay it's not life or death we're doing this because we want to yeah okay good all right um mad says running seems to make me eat like a horse if you cut down you feel my god i am not eating enough and when you eat more, you worry you eat too much. In your experience, how do you gauge that balance? I want you to speak to this, definitely. My, I'm the food queen. Well, right now, <laughs> I just eat whatever the hell I want all the time. You guys should see, I might show you. Actually, should I show them the Yeah, candy? yeah, okay. Let's see if we can flip this around. Can you see all the candy? Okay, that's literally <laughs> what I just bought at the store this morning, candy. Isn't when that bargain really bad? Easter candy shopping. That's yeah. like all for me and Steve. So if I end up with diabetes in a few months, you know why. But, okay, back to the point. Um, balancing. Um, you know, I've always edged on the side of overeating than undereating because I think far too many... I cannot stand it when people would start talking about racing weight. And you guys know I am a huge fan of Matt Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. but I, that's one area I do not agree with him on. I don't think there's a racing weight. I think you need to let, again, listen to your body and let your body tell you where it wants to sit. And um, so I've always, you know when you say about you know i feel like when you try and stop eating more you kind of want it more like if you kind of focus on i need to eat a certain amount of calories or i need to um you know cut this many calories that's and you say i'm not going to eat this food or i'm not going to eat that that's when you want it more you crave it more and you just get more and more frustrated so for me i've always just kind of like if you're hungry and your body even if you've just eaten two hours ago like just eat again um and i would almost rather people be i know like a lot of people are, feel like they're too big or whatever mm -hmm. but i honestly don't agree with that in a lot of ways because i think i would rather people be and obviously there's a there's a you know certain point where you kind of need to be careful but for the most part you're out there running you're out there doing it so i kind of feel like i think it's better to kind of overeat then go down that path of that's the less from two evils for sure yeah. i would agree yeah. with that what do, what do you think? well it's just it made me think of you guys know who ryan hall is right he's incredible american record holder in the marathon and he said something once that just completely resonated with me he said you know i used to think that i had to have those two thick legs and look like a kenyan in order to run the times they're running but he said that when he was his heaviest was when he set his, which is obviously not true now because he's put on quite a bit of weight <laughs> purposefully. Um, but I don't think he could run into a four marathon right now. Right. I'll just say that. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's, and I, I find the same thing. I, Boston last year, I dropped down to the lowest weight I think I've been in a long time. And it did not, the last 10K, I felt like I had no fuel to draw from. Um, and I thought originally leading in, it was a flawed mindset. I thought, you know, okay, I need to be as light as possible in order to get up and over those hills. And, and that's going to serve me really well on Boston's course. But the truth is, actually kind of the opposite it does help to to be a little bit and the other american woman i was racing with i would say she had probably about 15 at least 15 pounds on me and i think it served her really well yeah. because she was able to really hammer those downhills and and it worked in her favor and so i do think that is and, and tina and i are the same way now we do not weigh each other or i'm sorry we do not weigh ourselves <laughs> we definitely don't weigh ourselves. Good on the scale. <laughs> Oh, we definitely, we don't, um, I don't want to know the numbers. I don't. And it's the same reason I don't want to know like my VO2 max is because I don't want to slap a number on and say, okay, that's my potential or that's my limit. I am as fast as I am in this moment. And my body is what it is right now because I'm eating well and I'm running a lot. Um, so that to me is, it's a really dangerous game to play, especially because if you, you know, see what your race is and you run a good, or you see what your weight is, you run a good race and you say, okay, well, I need to be a little lower than that if I want to run faster. That is not how it works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Once again, the moral of this entire story is listen to your body. Trust your body. I know it's hard, especially with all these gadgets we have, but that's honestly the best way you're going to get the most out of yourself. Does anyone have any other last minute questions for Sarah? Um, if you have anything else, was there anything else we were going to talk about? Uh, you I guess we could talk about what's next for both of us, yeah. you know. Um, so, well, well, they know what's going on with me. Okay, I guess I've been seeing true. plenty of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, thank God, I'm stepping back to the longer distance races. 
Um, so I'm headed to the U.S. Half Marathon Championships in a couple of weeks on April 29th, and then the U.S. 25K Championships after that. And I do feel like no matter how much I try to target that speed, it's just my my natural ability is is meant to run long distance. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. But do you feel the, the speed is like it's worthwhile doing? So someone oh, listening sure. right now, if they are a marathoner, have done a lot, a lot of marathons in a row. Would you suggest they go back to speed even if they're not that good oh, at it? Oh, if you're a marathoner, you should have a time in the year that you step back and you run 5Ks and 10Ks. You should because that speed, developing that threshold is actually going to serve you so well towards the marathon, um, both by the actual physiological benefits, but also because it really helps put that marathon in perspective. That's why you see someone like Alberto Salazar right before he won um, Boston in Duel in the Sun. A week before that, he ran a 10K and I think he tied the world record. It was something like that. Wow. A lot of professional athletes will run a very short race, 5K or 10K, a week or two before the marathon because then you step out there and you start running marathon your pace. You're like, this is a joke. This Mm -hmm. is so easy. Mm -hmm. Um, So really having a tune-up, a short tune-up race before before a marathon is a good idea, but maybe having a season, like a summer season where you go out and say, look, there's a running club in my town. I'm going to go run their local 5Ks all summer and really develop my top end speed, and that's going to serve you well over the course of the marathon for sure. I definitely agree. And I'm going to put a link in the comments to an article that I wrote about that which covers this exact thing so it'll kind of be a summary and reminder for you um we have a good question here from jill so i just want to get to that when you are racing a marathon how do you run by feel in terms of breathing do you run the first half at conversational pace or is that too conservative this is a good question Mm -hmm. do you run in the run the middle to last miles at a pace where you can speak a few words or is that too fast and it's funny because and i know we've talked about this a lot but breathing versus uh, like cardiovascular fitness versus muscular endurance like for me I could talk if I'm running a 10K. I could speak, but my body, my legs are running as hard as they possibly can. So it's like, no matter how hard I run, my cardiovascular fitness is, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm so aerobic that like, I don't ever struggle. I'm never like, like during the, (laughs) okay, sometimes, a few times, but. Don't compare to me though. Because like, I feel like that's what would go first (laughs) is your breathing and not your legs. Like your legs would feel fine, but you're like, I can't breathe. So it's like you, and I, I feel like for you, for everyone, if you're running at your red line, that means either your your muscles are done or your cardiovascular, your breathing is done. And for me, that's that's never an issue. So I can talk all the way through a marathon, even though I can't, the, the last 10K, I can't possibly run any faster. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but how do you know if you're running by feel? Um, well, how do you know if you're running, like, let's say the from the... You know, the first three or four miles, just whatever, like, you know, let's just let myself get into a rhythm. But then from miles, like, let's say six to 12, like, how do they know what's easy? How For sure. do you know? Based on your, like, muscle. Right. And so the only way I can describe this is kind of going back to that that concept of the animal inside you who... Um, who really gets in touch with like knowing what it means to run from point A to point B. So if you're trained properly for a marathon and you're running it, the only way I can describe it is it's right at that line of comfortably uncomfortable. Um, so it's right at that line where you're like, okay, I can maintain this, mm. but it's not pleasant. So for me, and I think about Houston Marathon this year where it was 67 at the start, 95% humidity. And I remember running the first couple miles at 555. And on a normal day, that would not be hard for a marathon. But something in my head, a red flag went up and it was like, no, you have to slow down. And so I ended up slowing down, just backing off five minutes or five seconds a mile, <laughs> five minutes a mile, <laughs> 11 minute miles. Um, no, but five seconds a mile. And that was exactly where I needed to be. And so it's, it's running by feel means knowing that sometimes um, you're going to have to let your pace plan go and understand that like, I just, I know in my gut right now that that's too fast, that I would blow up at that pace Mm -hmm. and being willing to sit back, especially on a day like today at Boston where it's 72 degrees. And no matter what, so many runners go into a marathon. They say, this is my goal race. So no Mm -hmm. matter what the conditions I'm sticking to my splits. Mm -hmm. And then they end up blowing up and running a 20 minute positive split. When the better thing you can do is say, okay, I'm just going to back off a hair back to that pace that I've run all season and I know feels like marathon pace, even if it's not exactly on the numbers by my watch. Um, so that's the only way I can describe it is just really trusting your instinct. And it helps if you run, because I've run eight, nine, eight marathons at this point. So like I've, I've, I know what that pace feels like. Um, so that definitely helps. Yeah. And I would just add to that that like, you know... I've, I've hounded in your head about um, running by feel, running by effort, you know, using this effort scale kind of thing. But what Sarah said, really, you have to be realistic with yourself. So like at that six, round six miles, eight miles or whatever, you have to say to yourself, do I realistically think I could keep this up for another 14 miles? Mm-hmm. And yes, you're going to go through waves where you're like, I can't possibly keep this pace up. Oh my God, how am I going to even make it to the finish line? And 
that's natural. That's going to so happen. So what do you do? Because for me, it's like when I hit that patch, I'm like, I'm going to count 600 steps. That's my thing. I'm like, I'm going to count those numbers and that's all I'm going to think about. Like, how do you get through a rough patch? Because rough patches are going to happen in the mm -hmm. marathon, even on, on a great day. That's when I do the be kind to yourself thing. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll imagine Steve is alongside me and he's like, it's okay, babe, you're fine. Mm -hmm. And I know Steve was really quiet yesterday and he wasn't really talking, <laughs> but he, he hates being on the camera, which Sarah <laughs> knows and can attest that Steve is a very, very lovely person. He He's is just wonderful. very, very yeah. shy. But anyway. You have to crack that little shell and <laughs> yeah. it's not going to happen on camera. No. But, yeah. but anyway, so I imagine Steve is alongside me kind of saying, it's all right, babe, you're doing great. Like, you can keep this going. I know it hurts, but you're fine. Like, so I would kind of just imagine like reassuring myself like a like I was a little child that like needed some reassurance so that's that's what gets me through um but it's it's you're gonna go through those patches but overall you should just you'll know in your gut and it that's why it comes down to that gut feeling like Sarah said she backed off to a pace that felt like marathon pace so even on a on a um hot day or a windy day or whatever you're gonna your pace the numbers are gonna almost lie to you but you're going to run what feels like, what the effort feels like, what marathon pace should be. And the way that I know that most runners are capable of doing this is because most runners, when they finish the race, especially if it went poorly and it was a positive, but they say, you know, I kind of knew at mile 10 that I should probably back off, but I wanted to keep pushing. You know, like yeah. honestly you do. And especially if you've done a couple marathons, like you know when you're running too hard and, and you have to be willing to, to kind of like throw time out the window. And it's a hard thing to do because in the marathon like that's the thing that means the most to us is hitting those time goals especially because we can only run a couple of them a year if we want to train for them properly and then mm -hmm. you don't want to wait six months to go after that goal again and that's an incredibly hard thing to do like at houston i ran 238 and i was really upset because i wanted to, to break 230 but on a day like that i would rather have run 238 smart the way that i did than go out to run 230 blow up and run 250. Mm -hmm. um so yeah that's the only thing i can say it's, it's easy in retrospect to look back at your race and say okay that's where i should have done things differently so if you can identify that and maybe even after the race write that down so you don't forget be like yes, okay yes. this is how it felt this is what i need to remember because we have a short memory in running especially <laughs> if we didn't we wouldn't want to do the marathon again um because i can't i'm sure same time every time i finished a marathon like never never again <laughs> yeah. um so yeah so that's that's kind of my thought on, on effort versus pace just before we finish i just want one more thing because i nearly wrote about it in my monster long blog post this morning about um staying positive and when you're depressed with injuries but you know, I talked about my calf strain that I had and I just want you to tell people your perspective of when we ran that race at nationals, um, you know, I talked in this, in this, um, blog post and if you downloaded the PDF, you can literally see the page in my journal where I was writing about this calf injury. But Sarah, um, I remember specifically telling her like about that. I had a calf strain. I strained my calf. I needed a month off running. I could cross train, but I was going to get there and I was determined to get there. And you knew you won that mm -hmm. race, but you knew how much it meant to me. So can you kind of maybe tell your story about what your version of that was? So that, um, do you know what I'm talking I about? I do. You're talking about the 10K nationals. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because the first thing I did when I crossed the line, I immediately turned around and tried to find you on the track. <laughs> um, it just cracks me up. But, and Tina and I become friends um, pretty early on in our running career. What year was that? That we the P year we were drug tested at the same time, <laughs> so we were literally running for real again, yeah. <laughs> sitting there with little cups because we were so dehydrated we yeah. couldn't fill to the line. Little cups of our own pee. We were chatting over cups of pee, um, and so we became <laughs> friends. And uh, and so it, we were hanging out every nationals, but it's like I had I had watched Tina go through this, and it's tough because until I had got and last year I had my first injury pretty much ever which is amazing. Um, yeah, it's crazy. But, uh, and I, I didn't really, and I knew what you were going through, but I guess I, I didn't fully appreciate it, but I also thought it given, and even as the race was going on and I ran hard from the gun and you, I, you I, were pissed up, that day. I was very, yeah, we won't get into that, <laughs> yeah, but um, I ended up uh, breaking, uh, I think it was a 25 year old NCAA record. I held the, the record for the national meet and I knew too that I, I didn't know if that was going to play out in your strengths because I also thought, okay, Tina's been in the pool for a really, really long time. She might not be fit enough to run a PR right now, but um, to look back and to see you finish top five because I thought Tina's lucky to be here. Mm -hmm. Like you're very lucky to be standing on that starting line to be even competing in this race, but watching you do so well was like, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, it felt in that moment like you had had a better race than I had. Mm. I know that sounds crazy, but do you know what I, you know yeah, what I mean? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't gone through what she had gone through all that spring. And so um, 
it can definitely help to, especially if you have someone that you love who's a runner, you know, to watch them come back from something. And I think it running to me, the, the, the thing that is the most valuable is not necessarily those moments on top where I broke the record, but it, it's seeing that unlikely little dandelion burst through an inch of mm-hmm. concrete. And you're mm-hmm. like, how did you do that? Because every time you rise after you fall, like that to me is the most inspirational thing. It's not staying on your feet for years and years and years without an injury. It's the people who continually rise. And I, I do hope that I have the strength if I ever have to go through something like that. I hope I have the strength to rise from it with, with the grace that you did. And when you did, you know, last year when you were coming back. I didn't handle it well emotionally, but yeah. <laughs> just... Well, I don't know. I feel like you did, like everyone would have handled it. You actually did handle I think you did handle yeah. it very well. But what I just kind of wanted her to say that for is, you know, for anyone listening with injuries, like, you know, I talked about that today, but you can come back, you will come back, but more that like you never know who you're impacting around you. So you could be, you could be inspiring your friends, you could be inspiring your family. If you write it down in a journal, you could read it and inspire someone someday. If you write it in a blog or in a Facebook post, you'd never know who you could be impacting. And Sarah talked about what she's been going through lately. I've talked about what I've been going through lately. So Ooh. just kind of be brave and share things. We did. We talked about. about that too, about social media and how people are afraid to, sh- to share like mm-hmm. the, the crappy stuff. They're afraid to share the moments where you're struggling. You're like, guys, things aren't going well and this is why. Um, but honestly, it's like if you can choose to open yourself up to your... Because every single person, that's the way... Our, our culture has demanded that we perform. We have demanded mm-hmm. an audience. And so if you can be real with your audience, if you can open up and be like, hey, guys, like this isn't going well, um, rather than just presenting your life as this highlight reel of this highly filtered, I am on vacation. <laughs> you know, things are going great even when they're not. If you can open yourself up, people are going to see that, you know, and people are going to respond well to that. And, and not only that, but it's like what really really matters in this running community is lifting each other up like it is mm-hmm. it is a community and I know I'm a little bit biased but especially as women you know it's really yeah. important that we do that for each other and and to share the struggles as well so I really honestly want to encourage that and and not in necessarily in a whiny self-indulgent way where you're like guys things are bad tell me I'm pretty you know it's like not like that but to like be like okay like just so you know I'm I'm a 232 marathoner I haven't been in two and a half years and I'm running not great right now. And by the way, guys, last week, my sister almost beat me. Like that's, that's the kind of things that are happening right now. And it's, and it's tough. And, um, you know, to, but to see that other people are going through that, it can help you feel not like you're not so alone. Yep. Great. Thank you. So mm-hmm. be brave. We have a lot of love coming for you here. Uh, so, uh, Sasha says, thanks for the help. You've helped me a lot as my coach. Can I thank you more? Tim says, thank you. Encouragement. Kalise says thank you so much. She loves Sarah Crouch. Huh. I love Sarah Crouch. I love you too, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> um, Blush. What would you like to say? Anyone, you know, I'll put a link to Sarah's blog in here. Anything else that you... Did you want to do your whole favorite running this and running that? I guess, I don't know if you do. I've, I've never... I do different questions now. I guess um, if you could think of like one or two rapid fire, we could do that, but I can't okay. think of any. Yeah, I would have need to thought about it. We can, we can do that next time. Okay, we'll do that Because I'll, I'll be having Sarah on this again. Um, but I can't even remember. Can anyone remember what the questions are? I'm, I know I'm, you said like your favorite. Uh, okay, okay, I've got it. Okay. So your first one is a nutrition tip. Oh, um, you probably got this one. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. And it's funny because it's almost all worn off. But like the, the the fueling brand I use is You Can Now, and it's funny. But well, I wasn't even talking about that. But okay. Oh, Keep going. <laughs> oh, oh, that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you, we do. This love is you my can. New Year's resolution, and guys, I've stuck to it. I've stuck to my resolution. I'm one of the two percent, I think. But I've drank <laughs> a gallon of water a day every day this year, and I definitely recommend if you're going to do that, throw in some electrolytes as well because you don't want to wash your system out. It's 128 ounces, but now that I do it. Um, it was hard at first for like the first month, I'd say Mm -hmm. it was really hard to make sure that I was getting, I felt like I was like full of water all the time, but now it's completely natural. I feel like it's made a big difference. My, even like my skin feels better. Like everything, it just, I, I, I was really bad at hydration for the last several years. So this has definitely helped. That's my nutrition tip is drink more water for everybody. And for you can, we do love you can. And also if she was talking about electrolytes, that's what I use actually. Yeah. yeah, We both use, um, Endurapax, which you can get 10% off with. So yeah, yeah, this is easy to use. Um, okay, next one is a, um, a, a you, I mean, you've said enough, so you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, uh, like a low moment or a real moment, a funny moment or something running for real. Oh, oh, how real do we want to get? Go for it. Um, I almost crapped my pants at the Olympic trials and had to drop out. <laughs> I was 22 laps into a 25 lap 5k and I was like, nope, not going to make it. And I legitimately, the race was not going well anyways, but I, I just had one of those moments where I was like, 
in that moment, it wasn't worth it. It was not worth it to do that in front of 22,000 people. So I just made a beeline under the stadium. and, and uh, That's definitely real. And uh, yeah. I'm sure we've been through that at some point. Um, so okay. that happened. And yeah. then on the other end of the spectrum, what's the high moment? Ooh, I mean, Boston was pretty unbeatable. Not necessarily the finish or anything like that, but the feeling of running Boston and seeing nothing but open road in front of me, it it was the most surreal thing, especially, and if you guys have run Boston, you know this, Wellesley College, like (laughs) having that noise, it's like, oh, it is deafening, but it was... um, I, it was a hot day and I got chills all, all over my entire body um, just running past the people and knowing like, oh my gosh, I'm leading the Boston Marathon. That, that's something I'll remember when I'm 80. When everything else is gone, that, that memory will be stuck in there, I'm sure. Okay, good. And um, what's the final question? I can't even remember. Can you guys remember what the final question is? Uh, Someone says how much of the cake is left. What does that mean? <laughs> I told you I made a cake of this. Okay. There's only a quarter left. Isn't that embarrassing? I did get <laughs> Drew a little. Oh, do you enjoy our tropical fruit selection? My <laughs> fruit. <laughs> I'm trying to show you that I can eat healthy sometimes. You can have some of this. If you want. Oh, I'll have to. Sarah didn't even know this is here. I've been no. hiding it from her, Eddie, and now she knows. <laughs> well, what kind of a cake is it? It's a white chocolate cake. Oh. Cheese frosting. I'm not a huge fan of white chocolate, but that looks delicious. It's got Cadbury eggs on top. No, 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 no. no. Uh. You guys listened yesterday. <laughs> they're not Cadbury eggs. What are they? They're mini eggs. Mini oh, well, they're eggs, mini made eggs. by Cadbury. We can see the See, the, the that's right all here. that's left, Eddie. And can I just say, that was yesterday, Steve and I. We, we haven't even had any today. Yeah. That is embarrassing. Well, Steve's not going to get any because I'm going to eat it before yeah, he gets home. Okay. So there yeah. you go. Um, I can't remember what my final... Oh, oh, yeah, that was it. Thank you, guys. Um, what, what do you tell yourself when you're in the start line of a race? <laughs> oh, man. I, I don't think there's like one particular thing. Um, I tend to do, I, I am like a spiritual person, but I feel like 90% of my prayers have happened on the starting <laughs> line. You know? um, so that's, that's, that kind of happens a lot, but also it's like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, the, for me, a really emotional moment is hearing the national anthem. I don't know if do they play that at London, like, like with the. Do they play not the that? Not our national, <laughs> your national anthem. That would be awesome. <laughs> like the Star Spangled Banner. Let's what is it called? Just... Your national God save the queen. God save the queen. Why do no, you think it's Union that. Jack? That's your no, flag. No, but I do like hearing the American national. Anthem. Right, that to me is a moment where I, I always have to remind myself, hey, you are lucky. This is your job. You get to stand out here and do this for a living and mm-hmm. make a living on your legs. And I always just remind myself that I'm a very lucky person. And if you're standing on the starting line, you're healthy, you have strong legs beneath you, you are a very, very lucky person. Yep. So remember okay, that. Great. All right, guys. All right, any anything else you want them to? You just want them to read your blog anywhere else? You want them to? Um. Go? I don't think so. I think okay. that's about about it for you. All right. Well, thank you guys for watching. It's been fun to chat to you. I will be having Sarah on again, as you guys see, we get on rather well. <laughs> rather sometimes. well. Actually, we hate each other. We're going to go strangle each other. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, hope you have a good rest of your day. If you did run Boston, congratulations. Congratulations. You finished a marathon, and that's something mm-hmm. to be celebrated. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.